So we'll see what happens with that. And it's all because you people keep coming in supporting these things. So I really appreciate that. But enough about that. Let's get on to our cast. And we'll make do some fun cold reading later. Anyway, here's J.P. Karliak. You can do better than that. Let's get the applause really going. Here's J.P. Karliak. We have Michael Scott. <laughs> anyway, everyone knows how I like to start this off. So, starting from JP, tell us some of the things that you're in, and then tell us about an obscure voiceover job that would make people's heads explode if they found out that was you. JP, let's start. Hi, I'm JP Karliak. Uh, my voiceover career includes Boss Baby on Netflix's Boss Baby Back in Business and Boss Baby Back in Business. Family, uh, I'm a Green Goblin on Spidey and His Amazing Friends. Uh, I played Willy Wonka, The Vision, a uh, bunch of Marvel characters. Uh, explodable character. Um, so many years ago, there was this thing called Marvel Mashups, which was like little interstitials of Marvel shows, kind of like Space Ghost, Ghost to Ghost. They were cut up and redone from the uh, 80s versions. And I got to play Black Cat. So uh, that's fine. Hello, Michael Scott, and I do a lot of random animation video games commercials, but the weird thing about my career is I'm like a low-key voice actor. We're already low-key as it is, so what I mean by that, I'm a lot of playable characters in games you play, like Monster Hunters, Battlefield, so you don't really see my character because it's customizable, it's like hands or a gun or like a knife, I'm like the first person shooter guy, but a lot of military shooters. Um, I'm in a show called Young Love, and I do a lot of voice matching. So sometimes you think you hear a celebrity or another voiceover person, but it's really me. So when you're watching Boss Baby and you hear some characters, uh, like, well, I don't think I'm allowed to say. <laughs> Basically, I do a lot of voices that you might think you hear another person, but it's really me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Um, and 
now here we are. And I think uh, probably, I do a lot of trailer and promo as well, and so I think of, of, of the big surprising thing would be I did the promo campaign for Ahsoka, which was super fun. It's not in Ahsoka, I did a lot of promo. Oh. Coming up next. Now the next question I like to ask people here since Phil brought it up is, what was your very first voice of the and how did it feel being moved for the first time? Uh, actually, that uh, Marvel matchup thing that I mentioned was my first game. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of us that were recording one after the other, and they knew it was my first game, so they let me walk in and watch the person who was in front of me. And it was Tom Kenny. <laughs> but I will say, like, watching Tom was actually really inspiring. It wasn't freaky because Tom kept saying, like, mm, I didn't like it. Let me do it again. I'm going to do it again. Uh, no, not, mm, I'm going to do it again. And it was like, oh, we can make mistakes. Oh, cool. So, yeah, uh, that was my first. My first were like commercials that you wouldn't know about, so I'll talk about video games. I do a lot of video games. I'm in Genshin Impact 2 of like 15 characters. Uh, I love that game. They just, just keep saying you. Keep saying you. <laughs> you can do a lot of random voices. To, like make sure the casting people know so you can keep booking extra characters. Uh, but Trials of Mana is uh, one of the first video games uh, that I did, and I got to be a character called Dark Majesty, which was cool because he was a villain. And so I got to do three different voices, kind of like one of those things where like you beat him and you think you beat him, and he's like, ha ha, there's more. And then he transforms like three different times. So like, it's it starts with basically my normal voice, and then by the end of it, he's like, like creature voice, which was cool because then I I started booking lots of creature voices. Um, and then the other big role, one of the big roles I started with is Tyrese on The Walking Dead. <laughs> um, my first voiceover role was a voice match for a young boy uh, for an obscure film called Richard the Stork. Uh, the young boy was very young and he couldn't do the efforts, so like the ah! <laughs> like that kind of stuff. So I was brought in to match his voice and I did all of the <laughs> all the efforts for him and as he was falling and laughing and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brooke, that brings up another point. Tell us how you got into this crazy business, because you have a great story about that. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, I moved down here from a small town called Reading, up in California. You've probably driven through it. Uh, and I moved down here back in 1997, June 1st of 97. And that mummy game I recorded June 1st, 2000. It was three years to the day that I moved down here. And I'm sure that means absolutely nothing, but at the time it felt like it was a, it was a sign. <laughs> um, and at the time I was managing game stops. I was managing a video game store, and so I just kind of slowly was doing like uh, games whenever I could like sneak out of, of work and record. And um, here it is. 23 years later, uh, and still chugging. So that's why I always say, remember this: this business is a marathon, not a sprint. Put in work and go good places. Now I'm you know, voice directing and at a table with some fine. Okay, so I mentioned Star Wars: The Old Republic, but I sort of forgot about there was. Something that was my very first book and it was even more of a surprise. And I was looking at Seattle at the time, and my, again, my on camera agent sent out a voice repetition. And I don't know what compelled me to even take the time to do it, because I was getting ready to move to LA, and I had to find somebody to record it for me. This is in 2005. I had to find somebody to record it, and then I recorded it, and then I had to deliver the CD to my agent. You know, it was like a whole thing. And I was like, okay, well, I, I don't know why I did that, but I, I did it, and I'm sure I will get it. And then I booked it. It was for Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. It was a video game. <laughs> <laughs> you guys remember that? Yeah. Way back when. That was my first. I was like, oh my god, really? Okay. Money to go to LA with. <laughs> and now in the next part of my stall tactics until Maggie gets here. <laughs> I feel like we're paneling in the meantime. Yeah. 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 It's one of those things, you know. It's 
It's never a panel unless you have some kind of chaos happening, but that's common kind for you. <laughs> so, JP, because diversity and representation is so important right now, tell us a little bit about all the work you've been doing at Queerbox. I get to do a free plug. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I run a nonprofit called Queerbox, which is a uh, online academy and community for LGBTQIA plus voice actors. Uh, I started it at the end of no beginning of 2021, and since then we have mm, somewhere around 700 members, an online talent directory with 900 people used by Disney, Netflix, Warner Brothers. You know, um, we do classes, uh, we do industry training, so people know that there's no such thing as a non-binary sound. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, super proud of the work that we're doing. We also have two sibling organizations. I have nothing to do with, but I love everything they do. One is, oh wait, they just renamed it. Voices of the Global Majority, who are for uh, voice actors of color, and also Disabled Voice Actors uh, Directory, which uh, is for and uh, they're all doing really cool stuff, so go check us out online. I have a panel coming up at four. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, the, business of, the business of voiceover uh, through a queer lens uh, is like at four o'clock to two. So check us out. Howdy. Give us a speed round of all the questions. All right. Tell these people some of the things you're in and then tell them about a voiceover job that would make their heads explode. Many things, and I'm in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell everyone how you broke the internet two years ago. Um, I was lady Dummy Trask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a white state. It's good to be here. <laughs> what was the first voiceover? Lady Dimitrask from Resident Evil Village. Can someone else answer questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really great about everyone else here. <laughs> Michael, you teach too, right? I teach. Uh, I am also a college professor, but I also teach lots of voiceover in terms of getting in the industry, but also to not get screwed over by some of the demo mills out there. So like if you're gonna go for one weekend and get a demo by the end, you do not want that for your career. Uh, what I recommend is that there are lots of legitimate voiceover conferences all over the country. VO Atlanta, there's one in Dallas, there are lots here in LA. Uh, there are also international ones. Go to those because you'll meet the actual industry people who can train you, mentor you, motivate you, guide you, so that you're not um, losing time and money for someone that's trying to take advantage of you. That's, that's really important. I'm also a board member of NAVA, the National Association of Voice Actors. Okay, a little tough. Similar to uh, representation and making sure everyone's voices get heard, that's what NAVA exists for. But also protections. Uh, there's, ironically, the other panel I was supposed to be in right now is NAVA down the street at the same time. Who's but, about that? Uh, I know. <laughs> All the voice actors come at the same time. But uh, I'll, I'll briefly say uh, NAVA is working really hard to protect voice actors in the AI space, artificial intelligence, because I, I, like I mentioned when I first started, um, I do a lot of voice matching, and so there need to be protections in place so that our voices aren't stolen. What's happening in short, if you're not an industry insider, it's like obviously all of our voices are all over the internet in different places. And with AI technology, that can be used to say like, I killed your mother, or I have your children, or you know, all these crazy things people use AI for, um, or even political ads that you may not agree with. So our, our purpose in NAVA is to make sure there are protections in place so that there's consent in where your voice is used, and that there's compensation. That's the Reader's Digest version, but I don't want to take the whole panel talking about it. But um, we're happy to have you, nava.org, to learn more. Thank you. Oh yes, I teach, I teach all, I, I teach uh, lots of things in video games from creature voices to efforts to the dramatic stuff. Um, find me on Instagram is the easiest way. Michael Scott Action, Michael Scott Action. I hate dominating the panel stuff. I like I'm talking too much. <laughs> but yes, I do teach. Um, and also I opened an esports program at my college, close colleges, so yes, there's lots of teaching going on. I, I, the reason I say that I have a passion. I'm not just 
a random person that's trying to coach you and make money teaching. Like I'm actually a credentialed professor and I was a high school principal and all that. So education is very important. And he actually cares. Yes, yeah. I do care. I care about all of you. I don't even know you that I care about. Um, I care that you're not taken advantage of. Thank you. Because we all started somewhere. People gave me a chance. People mentored me. They, 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 they gave me opportunities. And so I really, really believe in giving that back. So now I go to the conferences and I love it because I'm on the other side where I get to be the person in the panels and teaching and all that. Um, and I think we need more of that. And, and as a person of color, I do my best to help other people of color because I know the struggle it is to get up here. out there, uh, tie it in the performance capture. There's a lot of work for that because you already know tactical skills, how to clear a room, all that good stuff. So if you're pursuing this career, make sure your agent or the client knows that you have that military experience because it can also help you book a job because again, authenticity. Also, I'm an army veteran position preference. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to transition to the cold reading part. Who wants to hear these people oh, no. act? Yeah. Yeah. Woo! This is I have a radio play from the 1940s that I'm going to pull out. Everyone has roles assigned to them, and we're going to have some fun with it. Because this is completely cold. <laughs> we're going to do an old Superman radio play. <laughs> and I have scripts for it. So our narrator will be played by Brooke Chalmers. Uh, <laughs> and our announcer will be played by Marie Westbrook. And there's special direction for you, Marie. I would like every announcer line to be a different promo read. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's all highlighted. 
And finally, playing our American physicist Archer and Robin the Boy Woman will be Maggie Robertson. <laughs> this is going to get goofy and chaotic, but we're going to have some fun with this. Oh, and we are all panicking Swiss villagers. Yes, Good. that's all. <laughs> <laughs> My superpower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, will you be reading more like the SFX one? Nope, if you're not doing anything, you can do sound effects or make the audience do sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They don't have a script. <laughs> 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 Here's your <laughs> We got you, fam. Would you like to announce it? I could. All right. Done. Just like I've already done the work. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Ready, Ready to start whenever? <laughs> Faster than a speeding bullet. Gunshot with ricochet. <laughs> More powerful than a locomotive. Train whistle blows. Locomotive rumbles. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. <laughs> Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Loud rush of air, up and out. <laughs> and Superman came if you know it. <laughs> Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with amazing physical powers far beyond those of mortal men, and who disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, wages a never-ending battle for truth and justice. Beam up, Ben and background. Today, while Superman pits his strength against the might of the sun at the top of a towering snow-covered mountain in the Alps, Robert Archer and a group of terrified villagers stand far below and witness a hair-raising sight. Ominous, then out and behind. <coughs> Ominous rumbling. <laughs> the rumbling, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Avalanche, villagers panic. <laughs> 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 and now, the adventures of Superman. Just before he died, a famous nuclear physicist named Sir Hubert Clay confided the secret of a mighty sun weapon to his midget companion, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Shattered the world on the stroke of February 1st. Sir Hubert instructed the tiny man to find Robert Archer, a former assistant, who would be able to avert the catastrophe. With the aid of Superman, Freddy was on the verge of contacting Archer when he was captured by the Boot, an international conspirator who forced Sir Hubert's secret from him, then flew by plane to a distant mountain cave near the Swiss border where the mighty sun weapon had been set up. But at his moment of trial, the boot was killed by a mountain guide whom he, <laughs> whom he had tried to destroy. With only moments remaining before the unleashed atomic power of the sun would shatter the world, Superman streaked to the mountain cave and pitted his own titanic strength against the sun. Suddenly, there was a gigantic explosion, and the top of the great mountain was cast up toward the heavens in a vast shower of debris that carried the Man of Steel with it. <laughs> For a radius of a hundred miles, the sky was irradiated, and, or as in a tremendous pyrotechnic display, <laughs> and then the light faded, and in the quiet Alpine Valley, invisible under hundreds of tons of rock and stone and soiled snow, lay the sprawled, unmoving figure 
of Superman. He's dead. <laughs> Early the next morning, from the tiny village below the decapitated mountain, Robert Archer and Henri, the wounded guy, walked slowly into the valley. Certain that Superman was destroyed in the explosion, Henri carries a wreath of mountain flowers. When he and Archer reach the vast mound of soil and rock and uprooted trees, the guy places his wreath gently at the foot of the mound. Rest in peace, Superman. <laughs> <laughs> He gave his life that we and the rest of mankind could live on read. We, Miss Yolachia, he was a great and good man. <laughs> and now he's God. I can hardly believe it. Ah, it is not seem possible. <laughs> Wait. What is it, monsieur? Am I French not too? <laughs> 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 on your mother's side. Look, please. The man of the breeze. Sacre nerve, what are these people? <laughs> uh, great heavens, look! Uh, there's a hand coming out of the mound. And, oh, great Scott, Henry, it's Superman! No, 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 this cannot be! He's alive! Superman's alive! <sighs> uh, sorry I startled you, gentlemen. <laughs>
and hung from his arm is a tiny roll of duck. Hiya, Mr. Kent. <laughs> Hiya, Joe. <laughs> Who's you? Huh, Freddy. <laughs> when did they let you out of the hospital? Just now. Oh, well, I say, Mr. Kent, it was jolly decent of you to say that. <laughs> Uh, they did nothing of it, Freddy. Did it fit all right? Oh, perfectly. My other garments were completely ruined in the boot. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, doesn't he look sharp, though? <laughs> he certainly does. Come on, Freddy. Let me put you up on my desk. <laughs> and we can get a good look at you. Uh, very well. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. American audiences? Uh, why do you ask? Well, he's going back into the circus business. Oh, yes. I just signed up to appear with the great Bartram and Billing Circus, you know. You, you have? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes, indeed. And I'm to be one of their stellar attractions. Is that so? Most certainly. You look keen enough. Why, do you know I've been positively snowed under with officer, officer, officer. <laughs> I mean, when your story, crediting me with saving the whole blooming world, appeared in the Daily Planet, I... Well, that was pretty swell, then, Jim. It sure is. Oh, but I'll miss you, Freddy. I was, uh, kind of hoping you'd stick around here. Oh, well, I'll miss you too, old chap. Right. But, uh, well, you know, the house was the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why are you upset? Uh, it's Batman, Mr. Kent. Well, what about Batman? Well, he's gone. Gone? What do you mean? Uh, just what I said. He's gone, I tell you. But he's bat. I don't understand. Oh, Why he did I'm supposed to cut you off. Well, I'm afraid <laughs> we'll never see him again. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Startled, Clark Kent stares at young Dick Grayson, who chokes back the tears as he repeats. 
We'll never see more Batman again! <laughs> there, there, David. <laughs> what does Robin mean? What has happened to the great Batman? Fellows and girls, don't miss tomorrow's exciting episode when we begin a brand new and action-packed mystery adventure of Superman with Batman and Robin. Be sure to tune in tomorrow, same time, same station, for chapter one of a new adventure of Superman! Superman has a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman's for Captain Midnight, which follows just a moment. Yeah, and right after night. Captain Midnight, you'll hear Tom Mix and Hal Ralston straight shooters. This is a mutual broadcasting system. <laughs> 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 <laughs>